Hello, everyone. Um, we were just trying to work out um, a few minutes ago uh, when this was postponed from, um, and then I realised that, like the movie Mnemonic, I'd left myself an unconscious trail of clues to when it was. Attention to detail, it's uh, one of the most important things a UX designer can have. Um, quite often when we're doing these talks, um, they concentrate on a very uh, specific aspect of UX. You know, we might be talking about um, how you test virtual reality technology, or we might talk about testing with a particular group of users. So it's usually a very specific aspect of UX that's talked about. Um, and I think that one of the things that can happen occasionally is that if you concentrate uh, too hard on one little particular aspect, you kind of you, you, you can't see the wood for the trees, if you like. Um, and very often these talks are about a tree. Um, so I thought it might be quite nice tonight to actually sort of take a big long step back, like a telephoto lens coming all the way back, and have a look at the wood um, rather than the trees, and go right back to basics and talk about something which is um, not a mechanical um, sort of, uh, you know, specific aspect of UX, but that underpins everything we do. Um, and not just UX, actually absolutely everything that we do. Um, and that is uh, storytelling. So, um, what I'd like to ask, first of all, is when was the last time any of you told someone a story? Well, those of you with small children, it was probably <laughs> last night. Yeah. And when was the last time that somebody told you a story? Um, because I'm pretty sure that it was today and not very long ago today, because we live among stories. We inhabit a world where stories are all around us all the time. We interact with stories, and they're so immersed and so pervasive that sometimes we don't actually uh, recognize them, or at least we don't recognize them consciously. But when we do recognize them, they are instantly recognized. Everybody knows that phrase. Uh, stories have been with us since our very beginnings. They've been part of humanity since we were first human, really, as long as humans have existed. Um, they're kind of baked in communication devices, and they go way further back into our history than written uh, histories, or even oral histories. You know, they go right back to Paleolithic times. Um, stories and narratives are built into our brains. We've used them for millennia. Uh, from cave paintings all the way through to comic strips and modern day movies um, and, and things like that. Um, this is uh, the Chauvet Cave in France, in southern France. Um, and there are masses of paintings in that cave which go back, um, there's two periods of paintings. Some of them go back about 38,000 years and the others are slightly uh, more modern, uh, about sort of 28,000 years ago. And the truth is that nobody really knows exactly what they were for. Um, they may have been purely decorative, for all we know, but they almost certainly had some sort of ritual or religious significance, or some ceremonial significance, um, maybe. Uh, they might have been used to discuss ideas uh, relating to faith or fertility, or early mythology. There's a very famous part of this painting called The Venus and the Sorcerer, where there's very obvious, very obvious male and female principles being uh, depicted. Um, or, and I like this particular sort of theory best, maybe, they were used to um, educate younger members of the tribe in hunting and socialization. Uh, they were used to visualize and plan hunting expeditions, as you can see going on here. It, it, it's magical thinking. You paint it on a cave, and when you actually go out and do the hunt, it's going to happen because you've already embodied it in the narrative. So in a, fu in a funny sort of way, these are early UX practitioners creating prototypes of user experiences, stretching the point. But they were certainly meaningful to our uh, long ago kin. Um, the archaeologist um, Alistair Pike has said that these weren't people just decorating their living spaces. They were making a journey into darkness to do this. It was really important to them, these narratives. Um, and, and, and it's important to recognize that 
Um, it is a dangerous place you go into. This isn't somewhere you just walk in from the outside world and there they are on the wall. You know, you have to travel for about half an hour or so um, down tunnels which are barely wider than human shoulders. There's a 50-foot drop at one point before you get to here. So when you were in that environment, it must have been terrifying to um, more primitive uh, ancestors of ours. There's a, actually a lovely story about that. Well, the way that these were painted, I always had this idea for years and years and years that the way these were painted um, was actually kind of like we would paint with a, with a paintbrush or something like that, you know. But in fact, um, they were airbrushed, they think. So what they did was they took a, a hollow reed um, and they had pigment in a bowl and they blew through this hollow reed and used it to, to, to spray the pigment onto the cave uh, walls. And there's a wonderful sort of image that I have of, of these, these people down there in this terrifying darkness, lit by who knows what. Did they have fire? We you know, don't know. Um, they must have had something to actually be able to paint these things. Um, but then this extraordinary eerie noise of these, of these reed pipes being blown um, and, and the atmosphere of the cave. You know, there was something really numinous about it. Um, when we were originally going to do this talk was just after it had been discovered. The reason that I did this third one here, this little ladder here, this little red ladder, the significance of which, who knows, that was Neanderthals painted that. And we only discovered that literally a month or a month and a half ago, that Neanderthals, who've had this bad press, you know, our long lost cousins, the Neanderthals, who've had this bad press over the years, were actually painting. They were abstract painters. And I, I believe that, that they were creating narratives. Okay, so let's move forward a few thousand years to um, ancient Greece. Um, and the ancient Greek myths have extraordinary resonance. They've resonated down through history. Even today, they're extraordinarily modern. Uh, they have this staying power, I think, because they deal with archetypes of human behavior and character that still makes them seem incredibly modern uh, today. But the real importance of Greek myths in the story of storytelling, if you like, um, uh, Stephen Fry puts it really, really well in, in the forward to his recent um, book, uh, his retelling of the, of the Greek myths, which is called Mythos. And he says, the collective unconscious of many civilizations has told stories of angry gods, dying and renewing gods, fertility gods and goddesses, deities, demons, and spirits of earth, fire, air, and water. But the Greeks were the first people to make coherent narratives, a literature even, out of their gods, their monsters, and their heroes. And I think that's a lovely way of putting it. I mean, you can read the Greek, Greek myths now, and they still have resonance because they're about archetypes. Now, I suppose one of the first narratives, some of the first narratives that we're exposed to when we're children um, are fairy tales from Hans Andersen to Grimm um, and then Disney obviously and when you become older you uh, may read some of the retellers like Angela Carter in The Bloody Chamber for example. And the great thing with fairy tales is that the story always remains the same but the context and the reason for their existence changes according to the audience. Um, for example, we're now so used to the Disney retelling of these stories that we tend to forget that Cinderella, in the original story, murders her stepmother so that her father can marry someone else. We forget that the Wicked Queen in Snow White, as punishment, is made to put on red-hot iron shoes and dance in them until she falls down dead. And we forget that Ariel, the little mermaid in the Hans Andersen tale, far from getting her Prince Charming, is rejected by the Prince and dies alone and unloved. They're very far from Disney, those early things. They were salutary warning tales. They were grim tales, literally. Um, and Angela Carter, um, in her um, retelling of, uh, of, the, of the later um, uh, Book. She writes this, uh, this lovely book of short stories called The Bloody Chamber, and she uses fairy tales, again, the themes of fairy tales, to explore um, feminist issues and male and female sexuality. 
Um, Neil Jordan's film uh, The Company of Wolves is, a, is, is based on Angela Carter's short stories. Um, and uh, so, you know, she's using the same story but for very different reasons, in the same way that UX practitioners can take a, si a similar thing and use it in many different ways. So, why is it that stories, that narratives are so baked into our perceptions? Why do they have such power to, um, to hold our interest and grab our attention? Why do they provide such strong explanations for our day-to-day -day lives? Um, the best way to bring people on board and to engage people is to arouse them. So, what arouses people? Any ideas? What arouses people, in a general sense? Well, advertisers have known for uh, many years and have used it relentlessly um, the grim truth that there are three things that will arouse people. Um, and we uh, in Bunnyfoot like to call them the three F's. And the three F's are fear, food, and sex. <laughs> and if you go out of the uh, room today after this and you have a look at advertising, have a look how many adverts, billboards, magazine adverts, newspaper adverts, television adverts, use some combination of those three things. But there are two other things as well that actually arouse us. Another F, faces, we'll talk about faces in a, in a second, and stories. Adverts have stories to them. Um, think of going all the way back to, to the Nescafe couple. You know, any, everybody remember the Nescafe couple? That sort of constant unrequited love affair, that sort of never quite consummated love affair. If you look at adverts, they all have stories. They're telling us stories. Car adverts tell us stories about who we could be if only we bought the latest Ford Focus. You know, we could be living in a, in a beautiful log cabin with you know, wall-to-wall -wall glass in Scandinavia and, and, and being a concert violinist, you know, all that nonsense. They're all stories. So those are what arouse us. Um, we'll explore why that should be so. And it's to do with the way that the brain works and the way that we make decisions uh, about what's important and what isn't. How many brains have we each got? Each one of us, how many brains have we got? Well, the answer actually is three. All of us have three brains. Um, the first brain that developed about two and a half thousand million years ago was this little bit down here, and it's called the reptilian brain, the hind brain. Okay, and um, it, it, it's called the reptilian brain because everything pretty much from, from reptiles up has it. And what it does mainly is it deals with core life functions. It keeps you breathing, it keeps your heart beating, it keeps your hormones going. It also deals with territoriality and ritual behaviours. And it's really, really quick. Look at that, a hundredth of a second decisions are made. You're not conscious of that because of the speed. Then later on, a second brain developed, which is this middle bit here, called the mammalian brain, or the limbic system, about 200 million years ago. And that suddenly adds emotions into the mix, along with instinctive behaviour and, crucially, pattern matching. And we'll come back to that big time later on. And finally, very recently, only two or three million years ago, which is like a finger snap in um, evolutionary time, the cerebral cortex developed, the wrinkly bit that we all think of when you visualise a brain. And that deals with higher functions, it gave us cognition, and it gave us uh, consciousness, real thought for the first time, if you like. And in our case, it gave us language and mathematics and art and the ability to tell ourselves stories. But it's the pattern matching bit of that middle brain that's where stories get their power. Because crucially, we receive a massive amount of data every second of every day. Far too much data for our brains to be able to analyse. Um, if, if we analysed every single um, stimulus that came into us, second by second by second, we would never do anything. We would just be lost in this, this maelstrom of analysis. Um, we'd be frozen in place, completely unable to make any decisions. So, over the millennia, the human brain has evolved in a way that allows it to use shortcuts 
heuristic processing, to give it the scientific term. What it does is it uses rules of thumb and pattern matching to make decisions about our day-to-day -day activities. You don't have to think about everything you do. Your brain is making unconscious, unconscious decisions all the time using this pattern matching. It's flawed because that's where cognitive biases come from, along with a whole lot of other quirks of perception, a couple of which we'll look at in a minute. But in general, we're really, really good at it. And the really interesting thing about pattern matching is that it's to do with looking for structure, which is what stories provide. Stories provide structure. And what we're doing when we're pattern matching, we're making this, this this heuristic processing is we're looking for structure. But the crucial thing is it happens pre-attentively. What do I mean by that? Pre-attentive processing, which is actually one of the most useful aspects of perception for a UX designer, is what happens when the brain processes things incredibly quickly. I mean, look at, look at the processing power down here. Tenth of a second, it makes a decision. Um, and that allows us to cut through all of the clutter and make these instant decisions. So when we see once upon a time and we see uh, it was a dark and stormy night or we see a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away or we see it was the best of times, it was the worst of times and they all lived happily ever after, we know instantly that we're in a narrative. But narratives don't have to have those recognisable phrases. We can spot narratives all the time and we react to them really strongly. They're one of the strongest, if not the strongest, ways of communication that human beings have. And as UX designers, um, we are in the process of communicating. And it's a two-way communication and therefore we as UX designers should be able to use stories um, when we're designing user experiences and what we need to know is we need to know how to tell stories to our users in a way that's instantly recognizable to them and also how to listen to the stories that our users tell to and about themselves because that's the quickest and the simplest and the most intuitive way that we can build experiences that match our users' expectations, how our users visualise the world uh, and how it works, or at least that small part of it that we're, um, that we're in the business of designing at the time we're designing it. Um, it's how we communicate them with, with them powerfully and compellingly and completely. So telling our users a story means knowing what story to tell, how to tell that story, what works, what to avoid. It means listening to our users and then discovering how to understand their stories and turn those stories into useful, actionable user experience cues. So, how do we decide, A, what the story is that we want to tell, and B, how we're going to tell it? So tonight I want to explore a little bit about what a story is and then give a couple of examples or exercises or methods that Bunnyfoot use but that you can use, that anybody can use um, to actually open up those products and services that our customers use or that we provide in a way that makes these stories live. So let's return just for a moment to the pattern matching that we were talking about a little while ago. What's that? It's a face, isn't it? Yes. So who else sees faces in things? Clouds or tree bark or you know, curtain patterns? We all, we all do it. See, it's so common, it's even got a scientific name. It's called pareidolia. Pareidolia is seeing faces in things. And it's because we try to seek patterns and understanding in what we see. Faces are very special. There's a part of our brain called the facial fusiform focus. It lives in the limbic system, surprise, surprise, where emotions are buried. And it's so sensitive that it can be turned on, just like that. All it needs is two dots and a gash, two dots and a gash, two dots and a gash, and it goes, oh, face. So, what do you see there? It's a dog. But it's not, is it? It's a pattern of black blobs on a white background. But you see a dog because your brain creates that dog. Your pattern matching. And in fact, we process things from the top down. In other words, we try to make sense of the whole thing that we see 
before we start to analyse the component parts. You didn't sit there and work out, oh, so that blob is that kind of shape, and it's in relation to that blob there, so that you didn't have to work out what that was. Some people can't actually see that, which is interesting. Not everybody has it developed to such an extent, but most people just look at that and go, oh, dog, when it isn't anything of, uh, of, of the sort. So it's, yes, we make sense of the whole rather than the component parts. And this is something called Gestalt theory. Okay? And the Gestalt theorists, back in the 19th century, um, they followed the basic principle that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, or actually rather, the, the whole is other than the sum of a parts, of, of its parts. So for example, a car has a meaning separate to, different from, its component parts like tyres and paintwork and metal and so on and so forth. So in viewing the whole, a cognitive process takes place. The mind makes this unconscious leap from comprehending the parts to realising the whole. And that's kind of what stories do as well. We visually and we psychologically attempt to make order out of chaos, to bring harmony or structure from seemingly disconnected bits of information. And the way we do that visually is using what the Gestalt theorists called the principles of perception. Um, the principles of perception are a set of rules that govern the criteria by which that structure is imposed by our perception on what we see. So things that look visually similar, for example, will be seen as conceptually belonging together, while things that are visually dissimilar will seem to be unconnected. So what we're doing all the time is we're, in order to create this pattern matching, this structure, is we're looking for similarities, we're looking for differences, and we're assigning meaning to that on an unconscious level. And we'll explore a little bit how we can use that to create narratives um, later. Okay, so, so far so good. You're all sitting there thinking, yes, yeah, how is that applicable to the stories in the products and the services that we interact with every day? So, I'm going to use um, elements from those fairy stories that we talked about a little bit early. Okay, and since um, a panda there, that's you making sense of black blobs again. Since a panda is a kind of bear, I'm going to talk about the three bears. Unfortunately, Goldilocks doesn't figure in this particular version of the story. So, everybody should know this. You're in a fairy tale. There's bears. What do they eat? No. You're in a fairy tale. Bears don't eat people. They eat porridge. Quite right. And because this is a modern retelling of the story, they cook their porridge in a microwave. Okay? So, here's the thought experiment. Imagine, if you will, that you are one of the bears. You can choose to be any bear you want. You can be baby bear, mummy bear, or daddy bear. It doesn't matter. You're one of the bears, and you need to get your porridge just right. How would you do it using that microwave? <coughs> what would you do faced with that interface? <laughs> Blank stares, thank God. I was really, really frightened that somebody would go, well, I'll do that, 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 and that, that job's a good one. Not a bad guess. No. The fact that you're all sitting there staring at this interface sort of blankly, working out what's going on, is exactly the effect that I wanted to get. Okay, so, what about this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so the experiment worked. So, you know, bear or not, even humans, let alone fairy tale bears, really struggle with that interface. But as soon as you're faced with that interface, it makes much more sense. That, can we all agree, hopefully, that that is a much more seemingly intuitive, easy interface than that? It's that, that one. Well, we've got that one downstairs, <laughs> which is why I used it as that. So, what's the first thing that you, you, you'd click there? You, you, ten seconds, yours was. Yeah. You, well, everybody comes to it and goes, well, there's a massive, great, very visually prominent green button there. I'll press that. What does it do, that? No, it doesn't. 
Yes. No? <laughs> yeah, it turns it on. So you haven't actually done anything at all other than just hit a button for no real good reason because any of those other buttons could have... Then what do you do? God knows. What, you know, I mean, I've, oh, how long have we had that? How long have we had that microwave? Years. I mean, it, was, it, it followed us to this office from our previous <coughs> office, I think. None of us can use it properly. Johnny can use it um, because uh, Johnny uses uh, microwaves every day. But, uh, but anyway, so the reason is that, that, that I think that that interface doesn't work as well as that one. I mean, you know, interfaces are, you know, who knows. Um, is that there's actually, it, is that this one tells a better story than the other one does. So something as simple as a microwave interface is actually telling you a story. That's what I meant right at the beginning when I said we're surrounded by stories. Things are t telling us stories. And there's actually two levels of storytelling going on with an interface like this. There's the macro, which is what the thing is. That's the mental model that the user has of what the thing is and what it does. And then there's the micro, which is how the thing works. And that's told through things like affordance and signifiers. Does a button look like it's a button? Does it look like it's clickable? Does it look like it's pressable? Are things close together so that if I click that, that will happen? All of those things. So it's to do with stories. That's a good story. That, I think, is not a good story. Um, so we're storytelling creatures. We're, we're hooked on stories. We tell them to ourselves all the time. And all the best stories have a beginning where it's introduced. Once upon a time, there were three bears. They have a middle where, um, where sort of ac actions abound and surprises are there. Who's been sleeping in my bed? And then finally, it has an end and they all live happily ever after. A good story will always have a beginning and a middle and an end, recognisably so. And a good user journey should do exactly the same thing. The user should know exactly where to start the journey and they should be prepared for what's coming next. The journey itself should be logical and it should be progressive. There should be the relationships between elements telling the user exactly what's going on and exactly where they are in the process. And it should end up with a single action or result that tells them either that they are at the end of their process, that it's been successfully concluded, or it should give them a single logical handover to the next stage of the journey. That's a good user journey. In UX terms, you should always leave the user with one clear action to take, to take them to the next stage of their journey, even if that's leaving your design and going away. Um, the author, John Updike, sort of had quite a nice take on this when he said, um, he said I think this is a pro, you know, applicable to UX as well as writing. He said, a narrative is like a room on whose walls have been painted a number of false doors. While you're within the narrative, you have many apparent choices of exit. But when the author, the UX practitioner, leads you to one particular door, you know it's the right one because it opens. So I think that's quite a nice um, sort of model um, for, uh, for that as well. That, that beginning, middle and end, is the through line of your journey, your through line of uh, your narrative. Um, and the through line is actually one of the most fundamental and most important first things that you should actually have when you're designing something or writing a story. It's pretty much the most important thing to actually get right in your design. Think of the through line as being the thread on which you string the pearls of your narrative. It's the thing that stops them falling off and rolling all over the place and becoming random nonsense. And, you know, it's amazing how often in our day-to-day -day lives you come across things where the interface or the journey or whatever it is you're interacting with looks like that rather than that. You know, we've all been had the random pearls thing. So as part of an early UX uh, preparation and development, you should always try and encapsulate your through line. And you should be able to encapsulate it in one or two sentences. So one of the things that we often do as an exercise with stakeholders at the beginning of a, uh, a UX um, engagement is we get them to do this thing called an elevator pitch. Um, 
And what it does is it provides context for everything that actually comes. And this, this applies even when the project that you're coming on board with has already been conceptually quite well developed. Um, so an elevator pitch, it's called an elevator pitch, um, it should really be a lift pitch in the UK. Um, the, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, the premise is that you're going to have an elevator journey, a lift journey, with the person standing next to you who can write the cheque and make your project happen. And you've only got them for the duration of that lift journey, so 20, 30 seconds at most, unless you're in our London office, in which case you'll have at least four and a half hours and you can <laughs> explain it all in massive detail. But let's say that you've got 30 seconds, you've got a 30-second lift journey. So what you need to do, it's not a mission statement, because a mission statement is just, you know, vapid bollocks that people come up with to sell the whole thing. You know, that's Transco piping gas for you is a mission statement, you know. What an elevator pitch is, is you have to encapsulate what your thing is, what benefit it provides, who it provides that benefit to, how it differs from any of your competitors, or if it's a brand new thing, what it brings to the world, and that's it. So you have to be able to do that in one or two sentences. And it's really interesting to be in a stakeholder meeting with a whole bunch of people who might have been thinking about this thing that you're about to help them with for months and months and months. And you get them to do the individual elevator pitches and they're all different. They've all got a different focus. They're all telling a different story about the thing it is that they're going to design. So how are you going to design it if everybody's got a different story? So part of the elevator pitch is to actually... Um, you know, discuss and get collaboration and get one single elevator pitch. <clears throat> it's quite amazing sometimes the sort of gasp of realisation that goes around the room when they realise what it is they actually want to um, design. <coughs> Excuse me. So, once you've got, you've done your elevator pitch, once you've got your through line, how do you show users that narrative? How, especially as we're usually not writing a story. We might be designing a user journey or designing a screen or designing a, a page or, or whatever. We're, it might be predominantly visual, like those microwave interfaces. Well, going back, we use that pre-attentive encoding that we talked about earlier on. We use the Gestalt principles. We use the uh, ability of the brain to unconsciously process things top down and create meaning out of structures and visual relationships. What's the most important thing on that screen? Not a trick question, honestly. God, I made it really easy. What's the most important thing? The word brain, yeah. So, because um, we, 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 we can use things like proximity and, and similarity and difference, and we can use visual weighting. So, visual weight um, can be measured by the degree to which an element catches our attention or holds our attention, uh, keeps our interest, if you like. So, the primary uh, attention grabber on that screen, I think I'm right in saying, is the typeface brain. Um, because it's big and it's red and it's heavy. What's the second one? What's the secondary the, the thing that's of secondary interest? The picture. The picture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although you know that that probably will hold our attention a bit longer than that because it's a little bit more difficult to process. You have to think about that a little bit more. And what's the Johnny Come Lately? What's the one that nobody cares about? It's the little grey dot. Exactly. So visually dominant features, those with the heaviest weight, if you like, get noticed most. And they usually are used to signify either the beginning or the end of a journey, a narrative, a visual narrative, or something critical that happens in the middle. The hierarchy of the subsequent elements guide our eyes through the journey that we want our users to take. And the relative position of each of those elements gives us our visual narrative. It gives us information about the importance of each element. It gives us um, uh, a, a, an inkling of what happens after what, what is, what is key and what is subsequent. And it doesn't have to be top down. There's a top-down version, but it could equally be that. It could just as easily be that. It doesn't have to be a top-down hierarchy. So, 
I mentioned earlier that good UX is a process of two-way communication. Okay? Um, we need to tell our stories to the user, and we need to listen to and we need to understand their stories. So let's have a little look at the first of those. Let's look at telling our users stories. And I'll give you a couple of practical ways um, that can help us tell our story better to our users. And we'll use the visual hierarchy that we've just seen, and we'll use the principles of perception that we were talking about earlier on. Um, so uh, one of the ways that, uh, a little exercise that I think is really useful to do when you're designing something visual for the first time is actually to, um, at some point in the process, when you're, you're kind of okay with what you've got there, strip away all meaning from it. So take out all pictorial uh, stuff, take out all um, textual stuff, all copy, just get rid of it and reduce it all down to something that looks like that, just grey blocks. That's a useful thing to do. Which of those two layouts there tells the clearest story? B. Yeah, and why is that? It, it, it's because... Yeah, it's because it's got a really clear hierarchy. It tells a story. You know where to start, you know what's important, you know what's subservient, even what's connected. Things that belong together look like they belong together, and it's got a really nice, big, strong endpoint which hands you over. So, you know, that could be a web page, it could be a magazine page, it could be a mag microwave interface. You could actually take it, you know, that principle to almost anything that you design. And you'd be amazed, even nowadays, after you know, 20 years of UX development, how often you come across something that looks like that rather than looks like that. So it's a really simple thing to do. You know, you just look at what you've designed, turn it all into grey blocks of varying different degrees of size, shape, and, and tone, depending on, you know, what you've already done. And if it looks like that, brilliant. Stick all the meaning back again, and you've got a really good design. If it looks like that, have another little think. You're not quite there yet. You know, so it's a really, really simple little easy to do. Um, here's an example of it being used. Um, here we have four different circus posters, and they're all from different eras, and therefore they're incredibly different in their visual style. They all use different um, typefaces and things like that, but they've all solved that problem of hierarchy and what's important, I think, in, the, in, in, in different ways. It's the same problem being solved in different ways. So what's the most important thing that those, all those posters are telling us? The fact that it's a circus, exactly. What's the next most important thing they're telling us? Um, yes, could be. Some of them, it, it's when. But I, 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 I think it might be the name of the circus. It's the brand of the circus. It's Chipperfields. And then we go down a hierarchy. So, you know, funnily enough, actually, the, the bottom, with maybe the exception of that one, the, the bottom uh, part of the hierarchy, the least important thing on those circuses, is where and when they are. And if you reverse the hierarchy, you'd have posters that shouted in your face something was happening somewhere, and it told you exactly that, but you'd be none the wiser what it was. So, as I say, four different eras, four different circus posters, four completely different visual styles, but they're all doing exactly the same thing. Um, who here writes? Anybody here write at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fiction, non-fiction, doesn't matter. Fiction, yeah, I, I dabble a bit as well. Um, so this is about how we get the story in the first place. So when you're writing, those of you that write, do you ever read yourself the story out loud? No? You should, I think, because when you write and you read your story out loud, it actually m forces you to um, uncover little details, little, um, little, little things that are maybe, they're peripheral but important to the, 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 the story that you're telling. Um, little details 
um, that don't exist in the kind of simplified step by step by step. And I, I find when I'm writing that when I'm just writing, I'm doing the simplified step by step. It's something follows something follows something follows something. As soon as you start reading it, you start sort of doing having tone, adding tone and a voice to it. You start adding nuance to it. You start adding these little details. It's a, it's a useful thing to do. I think works for me. So how do we make sure? that we as UX designers, or people involved in producing products and services for people, don't miss those little peripheral details that will enhance our user experience. Um, there's actually several ways of doing it, but I'm going to give you now an example of a really great practical exercise that's very, very simple, but incredibly powerful in unlocking those little details along the way. It's best, again, done in a stakeholder workshop with, with, um, with people. It's part of a wider range of activities that you could loosely call journey mapping, I suppose, really. And it's called Post the Path. And here's me doing Post the Path with um, one of our clients a little while ago. So what you do is you get a group of stakeholders in a room together and you decide on the end-to-end -end journey that you're going to explore. So it might be sign up for something, it might be buy something, it might be get information about something, it doesn't matter what the journey is. You decide on the journey. And what you do is that you get every stakeholder in the room individually to write down on post-it notes the individual chapters in that story. So all the stages of that journey, one stage per post-it note, and you can also get them to write down the key thing that happens in each one of those chapters, just a couple of lines, what you can fit on a post-it note. So what you end up with then is you get everybody has a bundle of post-it notes and you get them all along the wall and you put them horizontally to tell the story. But what you do when you're doing it, and this is where the moderating comes in, is you try and align vertically identical stages that people have got. And you end up with this kind of grid of coloured post-it notes on a wall. And each horizontal is an individual story, and each vertical is where all the stories align and line up. So everybody's got that chapter six, everybody's got that chapter eight. Some people have got chapter four and chapter five in the middle, some people haven't. What you'll find is that some journeys will be very long with multiple stages, some journeys will be very short with a very few stages. So once you've got them all up there, what you do is you stand back and again, as a group, you discuss them and you analyse what's going on. Um, and you, what you're looking for um, is you're looking for uh, common themes, you're looking for similarities, you're looking for your pattern matching, you're looking for, um, uh, for, for where things differ, where things are the same. So the sort of questions that you should be asking yourself are, um, are there points where uh, it's not clear, where something is going on that you haven't explained enough? Uh, are there places where magical stuff is happening that suddenly you're playing back to the audience information that you haven't got because you haven't captured it yet? Um, is there redundancy? Are there points of confusion? Are there gaps? Are the long journeys too long because they've got too many stages in them? Are you breaking it down you know, too gr in, a, in a too granular a fashion? Are the short journeys too short and are missing out really important stuff that the user needs to do or that you need to find out? Um, and the goal with that is to, is to agree on a single communal story. And when you've got that, you've generally got the thing that you should be designing. It's a really, really simple but really, really powerful way of actually doing it. And you can see some examples of it going on there. Okay, so um, there's a couple of examples where we can practically give our stories, um, whether they're told visually on a page or on a screen or whether they exist in, in the real world, um, a structure and a form. Uh, that's how we can improve our storytelling. Just a couple of ways. There's lots of other things. I want to show you what happens when it goes wrong, though. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example from the Bunnyfoot archives. So, uh, imagine that you've signed up to a movie on demand subscription service. Okay, so you pay your monthly fee to belong to this uh, movie on demand service. Which movies out of that little selection that I've put up there would you expect to have to pay an additional fee for on top of your monthly subscription? 
just shout them out. So Paddington 2, Darkest Hour, The Blade Runner. Um, what is it that's making you do that? Why, why do you think that those are going to attract a premium fee on top of a subscription? Because they're new. Yeah? Yeah? So would you pay an additional fee for war games? No. No. Would you pay an additional fee for the wedding singer? No. No. Okay. So, <coughs> and nor would anyone. I mean, why, why, why would you? Forrest Gump, uh, you know, borderline, but no, probably not. But I would suggest that of those, Justice League, Blade Runner, Darkest Hour, Paddington 2, yes, all the others, no. So, about six years ago, Sky came calling on Bunnyfoot, and they were rolling out their non-contract subscription service, Now TV. Now, Now TV is now a very, very successful proposition indeed. It's a market leader, it's yada, yada, yada. It's gone from strength to strength over two, uh, over the six years since then. But at the time that they came to us, it was in beta. It was very new, okay? And they came to us because their sign-up process didn't seem to be working. It was underperforming, and they wanted to find out what was wrong with it so that they could increase their conversion rate within the beta test of their sign-up, okay? So it was a very, very quick, very, very simple little uh, piece of user testing on a limited number of screens uh, to find out what was wrong with their sign-up process. Identify the bottlenecks, fix it. Okay, so we... Got the, did the recruitment, got the participants in, uh, set it all up, and I started testing with it, with them. And about two sessions in, it became apparent that actually there wasn't anything wrong with their sign-up process at all, uh, from a purely mechanistic view. People were breezing through it, they had no problem at all, they were interacting with the data capture forms, they had no problem at all, but when they got to the end of it, they were going, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't click on it, I wouldn't absolutely not click on it. So what was happening um, was that they weren't signing up because they didn't understand, or if they did understand, they were actively put off by the proposition, not the sign-up screens. So I sort of went next door to where the clients were all sitting observing these sessions to be greeted by a, a row of rather glum faces. Um, we chatted for a few minutes and I told them why I thought that this was um, likely to be happening. Um, and it was agreed that what we'd do is re we'd refocus the rest of the testing sessions that day and the following day, not just to test the mechanical you know, validity of the sign-up screens, but to actually test to destruction the entire proposition behind, nine, behind, behind Now TV. And the upshot was that before they went live, Now TV rejigged their entire proposition um, on the basis, fundamentally, of that two days of testing. So um, the issue that the uh, testing revealed was that the story that their website was telling was the wrong one. It didn't match users' mental model of how that subscription service should uh, work. So let's have a quick look at um, some of the uh, uh, things. These are actual pages, six years later. So you know, these are some of the pages that were actually went into the report that we provided, which then went to quite senior decision makers in Sky. So. You had people who didn't understand the proposition that you kind of like had um, the, the, the £15 a month movie pass, which by the way, £15 a month, that's a lot more expensive than their, uh, than their um, uh, rivals, gave access to all the films on the site. That's what they thought. I pay £15 a month and I get access to all the films on the site, but the pay and play movies are Justice League, you know, or whatever it was back then, Blade Runner, blah, 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 are the, are the ones that I have to pay a bit extra for. But other customers came on with, and saw exactly the same pages, and they said, no, 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 the £15 a month, that buys me everything on the site, including the pay and play movies. And what it actually is, the pay and play movies, they're available individually, but I don't have to subscribe. So I can come on, and even though I'm not a subscriber, I can pay £3.50 or whatever it is, and I can watch those pay-to-play movies. No, both completely wrong. In actual fact, what it was, was that your £15 a month bought you all of the common, the, the recent, current, big blockbuster movies. So for your £15 a month, you could watch Blade Runner, you could watch Justice League, you could watch Paddington 2, you could watch Gary Oldman in uh, Darkest Hour. 
If you wanted to watch The Wedding Singer, that was £3.75 on top of your £15. People were outraged. The rage that was actually expressed to me in those testing sessions. But the, way it, the reason for that, though, was because of the way that Sky were licensing their movies, you see. The terms of the licensing allowed them to give people the, uh, the, the, the big blockbuster movies. That was all part of their USP. That's why it's £15 a month, because they've got those movies and nobody else has. Okay, so you'll have to wait to see them on Amazon or Netflix or any of those. You know, you can't see them on anything like that. We're now TV and we've got Justice League. We've got Darkest Hour. That's why you're paying the £15 a month. Nowhere on the site did it actually give any indication of any of that. Um, they expected, yeah, to get access to all the movies. Uh, so the big finding was that people didn't expect to pay extra for movies that they considered to be low value movies that they could pick up you know their local greengrocers they expected to pay a premium for content that was seen as being of value um and then and then this was the, 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 the usp that they didn't understand that the reason that now tv was so much more expensive was that it was more current than all its rivals um so customers judge currency by cinema release not by licensing so it's not we've got licenses for these movies and nobody else has therefore they're you know, um, so we um, gave it to them straight. We told them exactly what it was, and um, eventually, what they did was they went away and they rethought the entire way that Now TV was structured. They moved to a much more um, uh, understandable, uh, normal, expected uh, proposition. And here we are, six years later, and Now TV is uh, is really successful. So as soon as that proposition was changed to match the story that the users actually were telling themselves and, and, and they understood that high value things are additional and low value things are included, suddenly, that was once that was the basis of the charging, uh, rather than the licensing of the various movies, who cares, um, then it, it was all good. Um, so there we are, I mean that was you know, probably the, uh, the best eight grand that um, Sky ever spent, I suspect because the uh, ramifications of them rolling it all out nationwide with that flawed story at the heart of it would have been immense. Um, so there's an example of, of where telling the right story, changing the narrative to match the expectations of the audience, made a massive difference to the audience's perception of a service. I, you know, I shudder to think what would have happened if the original version of Now TV had, um, ha had gone live. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's telling stories. So let, let's have a little look at the other half of the equation, which, um, which is listening to um, stories and understanding our, our customer stories. So we're telling them a story, but in return, they're actually telling us stories all the time. And again, I'll give you a couple of practical um, little methods that you can use to, uh, to do this, and then I'll give you a real-world example from the Bunnyfoot archives. So... Most UX projects have at least one stage, often multiple stages, where research is conducted directly with the users or potential users of the product or the service. Um, and the research is usually done at the beginning. That's one of the places it happens, uh, where it provides a benchmark uh, for the future development if you're dealing with a, an already existing product or service or it um, develops a set of customer requirements if you're dealing with a product or a solution that's new um, or, or, or extended. Uh, that direct um, research with the customers also happens or should happen at critical stages uh, during the, um, the development where it validates the design decisions that have already been made and it unveils areas of improvement or places where it should be changed. And a big part of that research is what's going on here, which is formative user testing. And formative user testing is really just exploring by talking to, or more importantly, listening to um, customers, um, how they use a particular product or service, or how they would use a conceptual product or service. And it's at these crucial direct contact points with users that um, we need to listen and we need to understand the stories that they tell us. 
um, whether that's explicitly or implicitly. And I say implicitly because sometimes they won't really know the story that they want to tell you. And it's up to us as UX practitioners to actually tease out from what they say the through line of their story and give it form in the final design. And I'll give an example of that um, shortly. Now, when we're uh, interviewing people, when we're doing this formative user testing, we have a script. We have what's called a test protocol. We develop it um, in, in the immediate, immediately preceding the testing. And what that does is it provides rigor because we know that we're going to be testing the same topics and the same activities with all our participants so we can compare like with like when we come to finding those themes and things like that. And it also encapsulates and limits the goals of the testing that we're doing. You should always know in user testing what it is that you're hoping to get out of the testing, what it is that you want to get answers for, and you should know that before you embark on the testing. So within that script, there are rules as to the sorts of questions that you ask. Um, they should be unbiased, obviously. They should be non-leading, obviously. They should be open questions. And an open question is one that can't be answered yes or no. Because the last thing you want is informative user testing is for every question to be no, no, yes, no, yes. That's just tick box stuff and it's hopeless. Um, but sometimes when you're going along and you're using this, uh, this, this script, um, the participant will suddenly say something or do something, react in a way which is completely unexpected, that you couldn't possibly have uh, predicted, um, that isn't part of the script. And it might, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's odd, sometimes it's plain weird. Um, and, and one of the key uh, skills of a moderator is to recognise when that's happened and be prepared to go off-piste, if you like, and follow up, to depart from the script and follow up this oddity, to give the participant freedom to explore, freedom to tell their story. So what you do is you shut up, you stop asking questions, or at least dial them back, and you just let the participant talk, you let them tell their story. And very often what emerges is an unforeseen opportunity or an unpredictable issue. Uh, and sometimes it can be key and absolutely critical to the development of the experience. So the key for a moderator is to know when to let them ramble. You know, you might be thinking that, but listen to them. Because when they're allowed to formulate and tell their own story, they're being proactive instead of just reactive to your questions. And that's where the really interesting stuff starts to happen. Sometimes that reveals truth, if you like, is so powerful that a good moderator will actually incorporate it into all the succeeding sessions so that they can be validated. He can validate it, he or she can validate it as a, as a legitimate thing and not just an outlier. So somebody will say something, participant two will say something, and you test that with participant three, four, five, six, seven to validate it. So what do we do with those insights? So we hear these things. What, what we do when we're analysing the findings from the research is we come back to this old thing. We are looking for themes again. Um, it's a process called affinity mapping, which again is just a posh way of saying playing with post-its. What you do is you write them all down on post-its and then you spend hours and hours and hours sticking them to things and grouping them. And what we're doing is we're looking for connections and we're looking for commonalities in our users' stories. Themes and narratives, both spoken and unspoken, that we can use uh, in, in the development which will enhance the overall user experience. And those themes actually very often, going back a bit, provide the basis for the through lines that you hang the, the pearls of your narrative on. They're scenarios, if you like. Um, and a scenario is just a story of the way that a particular user interacts with your system over time. And um, very often what we're doing um, when we're creating a scenario is we will create a current scenario and then we'll create a future scenario when all the issues have been fixed, what we call the goals and blockers, the, the um, anxieties and blockers, and all of the uh, opportunities have been taken advantage of. So all the goals and, and, uh, and triggers are incorporated. If you like, we're creating two versions of the story, one with a sad ending and one with a happy ending. And the differences between those two stories 
actually drive out an embryonic set of requirements for our design? How do we actually turn this sad story into this happy story? And those activities, those actions that we need to do, that to-do list, that's the design, basically. There's the scenarios and there's some affinity mapping going on. Um, so, let's look at one such case. Uh, again, this is from the Bunnyfoot articles, uh, uh, archive. So, a, a little while ago, we did some work with the big cruise company, uh, Royal Caribbean. Um, and what they brought us on to do was to redesign and improve the experience of choosing and booking a cruise uh, with them. And it was a really nice project. It was a full end-to-end user-centered design project. So it started with competitor research and customer research right at the beginning. And it went all the way through to visual design um, at the end. And along the way, we created personas and we created scenarios and mental models. And we did journey mapping and we did wireframing and prototyping. You know, the full, everything went into the mix. It was beautiful. And it took, um, took about six to seven months um, start to finish. But what I want to talk about tonight is one tiny little bit of that um, design, one tiny little element which had an effect on the user's perception of the experience and therefore by extension of the Royal Caribbean brand, all out of proportion to its apparent size. And I want to talk about where it came from and why it was there. Now, one of the things that we're on the lookout for during the design process is things called delighters. Um, and what those are is they're small, very often peripheral little micro interactions that massively enhance the user experience, that people love when they see them. So why are they so important? Okay, this gentleman up here is Professor Noriaki Kano, for those who haven't come across him already. And this is his customer satisfaction model, often called the Kano uh, model. His background is in uh, quality uh, control, quality development. So Professor Carno has postulated that you can assign three primary actions, attributes, to any product or service, and they all contribute in slightly different ways to the overall customer satisfaction um, of that experience. And don't worry, it's not nearly as complicated as it looks. It's quite, uh, it's, it's quite simple. So the three attributes are basic attributes. The thing with basic attributes is they're absolute must-haves. Okay? They're expected by the user to the point where if they're not there, the user just ignores it completely. It's, it's non-functional according to the user. So the must-haves are absolutely expected. They're the cost of entry to a particular market, if you like. If you don't have them, you haven't got a product. Okay? Then you have things that he calls performance attributes, sometimes called one-dimensionals. And those are things that you can go live with your product or service without any of those, and it'll still work, but as soon as the users see them, they like them and they want more of them. So they're enhancements to the basic functioning of your product or service. Okay? And then the final ones are these delighter attributes. And the key thing about the delighter attributes is that they are unexpected. The audience doesn't know about them, so they can't tell you about them in the research. They come upon them by surprise, and they absolutely love them when they come across. Now, we all know about MVPs, right? Minimum viable products. It's, and particularly now, everybody's after MVPs, minimum viable products. And time and time again, when you're discussing MVPs with people, with clients, what they are is they're just this. Okay, we'll just put together the basic bare bones, just the basic functions, get it out there, see what people make of it. Well, the really interesting thing is what happens, what this diagram shows, is when you map these three attributes against customer satisfaction. So this horizontal axis shows nothing implemented, fully implemented. This is a dissatisfied customer becoming a delighted customer. If you map into just the basic attributes, by the time you've fully implemented all your basic attributes, so you've got a functional product, you haven't even reached the meh stage of customer satisfaction. You know, you haven't even reached halfway. They just don't care. So your MVP is going to fail. Okay? As soon as you start adding in the performance attributes, as you'd expect, there's a lovely rise in customer satisfaction the more of them you actually assign. The really interesting thing is when you start adding in delighter attributes, because even the moment you start 
you're already above that meh line, you're into a satisfied customer, and then there's this exponential rise in delight as you add more and more and more of these delighters. Okay. So the big takeaway lesson for any of you who go away and are asked to create MVPs as part of your work is, for God's sake, incorporate at least one of those two attributes as well as those. It's not enough just to have a basic functional product. You've got to have um, attributes from all three of those things. So, back to Royal Caribbean. Um, so we were, we were looking for these little delighters. We, we look for these, um, the, these, these delighters all, all, all the time. Um, so with Royal Caribbean, um, with Royal Caribbean, um, in the original customer research that we actually did for them, um, buried away in the responses from people were little comments like this. So we had half the fun of booking the cruise is in showing it off to friends and family. Um, I go back to the site even after I've booked to remind myself of where we're going. Otherwise, you tend to lose the anticipation a bit. I really like, you know, there were all of these little things were actually coming out. I really like to think about all the holiday milestones and the brilliant time I'm going to have. So what people were telling us time and time again was that one of the most pleasurable aspects of actually booking their cruise was revisiting their choices after they've made the booking. Um, and you know, service design, like all good uh, UX, tells us that the pre and the post experience is as important as the actual experience itself. Uh, so you have to design for that. No experience exists outside this sort of wider ecosystem. So people would return to the site and they'd revisit their choices, um, reminding themselves of what they bought, possibly justifying the huge amounts of money that they pay, because cruises aren't cheap, you know. Um, and they would, more often than not, sometimes slightly shamefacedly admit, too, that one of the reasons they did that was so they could show off to their friends and their relatives and their neighbours about this brilliant cruise that they got. They were not only keeping up with the Joneses, they were smashing the Smiths. Look where we're going, and this is our actual cabin. But they had to do all of that by returning to the site and searching for similar things all over again because they had no record of the thing they'd done. Once they'd hit that booking button and they'd got the well done, you've booked you know, a cruise um, 18 months from now or eight months from now, um, they had to go back and, and find it all again. So here's the uh, redesigned uh, confirmation page that we, we ended up designing for um, Royal Caribbean. Um, one of the most important things, main changes that we made to their uh, site, slightly going um, off-road off a bit, was to bring the look and feel of their brochureware pages, where you choose your cruise, forward and incorporate it throughout the booking process, because the original site was really, really good at um, whipping people into a frenzy of anticipation about this brilliant holiday they were going to have by pictures of these incredible ships with water slides and 15 swimming pools and, and all of that luxurious cabins and tropical skies and seas and all of that. And then you went into the booking process at, at, the, at the highest point of their anticipation and their excitement, you dumped them into a booking process that looked and felt like filling in your end of year tax return. And it was page after page after page because of it. And so you could see by the time they get to that all important buy your cruise now button and they spend their five and a half grand or whatever it is, you, you could actually see them, all the, all the anticipation and all the excitement just drain away from them, pale and dissipate and go. So keeping them reminded all the way through the booking process of what it is that they were actually purchasing was absolutely uh, uh, crucial. But... What I want to bring your attention to is this little bit here. That is our little delighter. Because what we did, as they made their selections uh, and they added to their holiday, all of their choices were stored and remembered. And immediately after booking, they were offered the chance of downloading a personalised, full-colour brochure of their holiday. That's not a generic you know, thing that everybody gets. That's actually in, in pictures, text, copy, everything of their particular holiday and the resort, the cabin, the whole holiday and their holiday, not just a generic one. 
and they could print it out, they could send it around, they could print it out at A3 and leave it on the coffee table and go, oh, you've noticed that. Yes, that's where we're going next. You know, we're, so, and, and, so, and it was brilliant. Let, so let's have a look at some of the reactions from people um, when we actually showed them the redesigned site. I like the personalised brochure. I definitely print it out and take it with me. The fact that it's personalised makes me feel important. Oh, that's cool. I can download it and make all my friends jealous. I don't recall ever having seen that before on websites. Damn right. Um, I might even put that on the coffee table or in the bathroom. <laughs> It'll give me something to look forward to. So you can see, there we are. It's a, it's a relatively minor design element in what turned out to be this huge, complex redesign of Royal Caribbean's browse and booking process. But as one of Nari Kano's delighters, it had, um, a, 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 it, it had an importance and a positive effect all out of proportion to its, uh, to its size, and it, it led to a massive increase in, um, in positive brand experience. And the only reason that it was in there um, was uh, through recognising and listening to a story that was buried away in that very early research six months before, very early on, before any of the bigger designing had actually been done. Uh, so. There we are. Um, I, I, um, I, I hope that that's given you uh, an idea of, uh, an appreciation of how important uh, storytelling and narratives uh, are to the whole user experience and in, indeed in, in, to our lives um, in general. Um, there's a couple of quotes that I've come across over the years which are quite nice. Jimmy Neal Smith, who's the director of the Storytelling Centre, the International Storytelling Centre, um, said that um, we're all storytellers. We all live... Um, in a network of stories, I think he describes it as. There isn't a stronger connection between people than storytelling. And um, the philosopher and uh, political activist Hannah Arendt has got a really nice take on it, which she says, storytelling reveals meaning without committing the mistake of defining it, which I think is really nice. Because it's up to us as designers to define it. What we need to find the, use the storytelling for is, is to find what the meaning is to begin with. And Robert McKee, who's a great screenwriting guru, um, said that storytelling is the most powerful way for us to put ideas out into the world. Um, I think I, I should leave the almost last word, though, to the late and very great Sir Terry Pratchett. Um, this lovely quote from, uh, from Terry, which is that people think that stories are shaped by people. In fact, it's the other way round. So, there we are. Um, we live surrounded by stories. Uh, we all have stories and everything is telling us stories. Everything we interact with um, is telling us a story in its own way. And as UX designers, I think it's incumbent on us to ensure that those stories uh, are as clear and as compelling and as complete as we can make them, as we possibly can. So. My story is done. Uh, it only uh, is left to me to write the final couple of sentences, which is, um, the audience turned as one, looked over their shoulders, saw there was still free beer in the fridge, <laughs> and they all lived happily ever after. Thank you very much. <laughs>